Okay, good morning everyone. So let's begin. So this is the 14th uh, Paase webinar. Our lecture is entitled 3D Printing Advanced Materials Additive Manufacturing for STEM Disciplines and Innovation. Our speaker for today is Governor's Chair at University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He is also a research professor at Case Western Reserve University and a fellow of the American Chemical Society. He is a fellow of the Polymer Science and Engineering Division, fellow of the po Polymer Chemistry Division, and he received the Distinguished Herman Mark Scholar Award in 2013. In 2018, he was elected National Academy of Science and Technology Philippines, and he recently has been appointed to the World Economic Forum Advanced Materials Council. He is the editor of MRS Communications and Reactive and Functional Polymers and has held a number of visiting professor positions, including Waseda University in Japan. His group does research in polymer materials, nanocomposites, colloidal science, 3D printing, hybrid materials, and ultra thin films towards applications from smart coatings to biomedical devices. He is very passionate in mentoring students and helping other countries in their STEM programs. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Rigoberto Advincola. Okay, Gobet, you may begin. Well, thank you very much, Kathleen, for Kay, for that uh, very generous introduction. And I'd like to thank our PAASE members and officers who are uh, joining us today, and also in the future for other listeners uh, who will be watching and listening to this uh, uh, presentation. So yeah, I would like to talk about 3D printing and um, Industry 4.0. So it's a, a little change on the uh, original title that Kay mentioned. Uh, and also, I would like to focus on some of the things we have been doing in the Philippines. As uh, Kay mentioned, I recently moved to uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory and University of Tennessee as governor's chair. But um, most, if not uh, the engagements I've had with the Philippines was, of course, carried when I was at Case Western Reserve University. And I still have my appointment there. In fact, I still have... Uh, five PhD students, uh, as well as my laboratory uh, there, um, who are finishing up. So let me start by uh, showing this collage of what 3D printing, additive manufacturing, um, rapid prototyping, Industry 4.0 means. This really is a paradigm by which uh, additive manufacturing has taken over many types of fabrication and supply chain um, systems, ecosystems that will transform uh, industrialization in any country actually, but more so with uh, uh, in combination of things like uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, block supply uh, chain models and so on. So yeah, I hope you will gain some of this insight as we go along with uh, describing what uh, industry uh, means in terms of uh, additive manufacturing. So back in 2016, I gave this talk at the World Economic Forum. Uh, I was invited uh, uh, to give a talk on uh, describing the future of additive manufacturing. And there I laid out many things that I observed then that this ecosystem uh, will bring much difference in how we do um, design, uh, manufacturing, even in space, tissue engineering, bio-inspired design, uh, different types of tooling, as well as fabrication or production of uh, um, tools uh, and even lightweighting. So we are familiar with 3D printing. Uh, if we simply buy a $200 3D printer, that's sufficient to start, yet many types of 3D printers today be uh, tuned for uh, mass production as well and uh, different types of chemistries. I'd like to uh, show that one of the things that amazed me with uh, 3D printing is that uh, one is able to mimic nature. In fact, um, looking at things that you can generate by computer or imaging 
one can translate this to different design principles, uh, biomechanics, and so on. Uh, 1997 actually was my first introduction to 3D printing. So even back then, more than 20 years ago, 23 years ago, uh, they were not using the term 3D printing, but at that time, I, I was made familiar with the term stereolithographic apparatus or SLA. So this type of photopolymerization, two photon polymerization is very efficient such that you can do lithography or um, uh, fabrication at the nanoscale or several hundred nanometer resolution, as you can see here. And this uh, makes use of photocross-linking chemistry using two photon resonance or um, uh, what they've used for <coughs> some imaging systems. On the other hand, uh, what is really been gaining ground is the application on prosthesis or thesis, dental devices, bio implants, bone replacement. As far as 3D printing is concerned, many types of companies have uh, recently been formed, uh, especially in the development of technologies that can be applied toward um, uh, tissue engineering and implants as well. And the beauty is that one, again, can take imaging, whether it's MRI, CAT scan, CT tomography, and then use that to translate that image into a CAD file that can be 3D printed with various <coughs> types of materials, uh, biomaterials. The beauty is that one can play with the design and the material approach to make uh, the uh, printed device uh, very specific for the person or a real gateway toward personal medicine. Uh, <clears throat> one of the bigger promises too is in the tissue engineering. Bio implant is an extension, bioprinting is an extension of bioplatting. One can differentiate cells or simply 3D print live cells that can be used to grow tissues. And as you know, growing a liver, a kidney simply means that you have vascularization and tissues that survive and proliferate uh, into larger uh, constructs or mass. Yet uh, in the area of aerospace and uh, light weighting and automotive, uh, one of the best uses of 3D printing is improving the design and efficiency, uh, aerodynamics, as well as um, um, efficiencies of uh, electric vehicles. Surprisingly, uh, 3D printing is finding its way in resurrecting old designs or even parts replacement, something that I'll describe to you as being very useful in the Philippines. Uh, 3D printing is also making its way in construction. So 3D printing of cement, civil structures, uh, different types of uh, um, fabrication for emergency response, uh, basically, 3D printing can go to very wide area uh, um, construction. Now, 3D printing is also present in art. Um, about four years ago, I came across this project, a collaboration between ING Bearings and Microsoft. And if you recognize this picture, this is a picture of Rembrandt. So Rembrandt, of course, is uh, the famous Dutch master. Uh, a lot of his paintings you cannot buy but they are available in museums. So what they did was they simply asked, can we use 3D printing artificial intelligence to resurrect Rembrandt? So what they did is they collected as many as they can of the Rembrandt or the master's paintings, uh, uh, deconstructed the symmetry, the depth, depth of the paint, the layer, the shadows, the style, etc. plug it in, to an algorithm and started printing something. That something which was printed by 3D printing, not by inkjet printing, because it involves layers of uh, materials and paint, resulted into a painting which looks like this. So this is a painting which Rembrandt would paint today if he were alive. Out of AI and 3D printing technology, this is another way to resurrect, if not create new designs that are influenced by previous masters. 
Now, 3D printing, probably in its most practical application to industry, can be used for rapid tooling, mold, design, tools, gauges, press, casting, uh, thermoforming, uh, embossing uh, materials. That is, 3D printing can yet play a role in industry, especially in the Philippines, to improve mass fabrication or uh, what we call a formative manufacturing. The reason is that some of these tools and implements are very expensive and hard to fabricate, takes a long time, but 3D printing short circuits the process by making it digital. Again, I'll explain to you later why this is so important uh, for the Philippines. So what you're seeing uh, with these examples that I gave you is that additive manufacturing or 3D printing is not your typical fabrication process such, such as injection molding, thermoforming, or what we call formative manufacturing. That is by design, they are able to make complex objects, complex designs uh, in objects, as well as improve material properties. They are not for typical conventional manufacturing simply because uh, the ecosystem is not yet there. So for example, when we talk about cutting, casting, injection molding, you have big lot sizes up to millions. On the other hand, additive manufacturing is good for making 10, 100 pieces, or even 1,000 pieces. So suffice it to say, there is a real manufacturing gap. However, meeting that gap is not really the biggest interest. The biggest interest is differentiating additive manufacturing from traditional manufacturing, which is higher complexity and high performance materials. So for some of you who are familiar with the terms FDM, SLA, SLS, these are of course acronyms of 3D printing techniques such as fused deposition modeling, stereolithography apparatus, selective laser sintering, etc. These are probably some of the more common methods of 3D printing. And they, again, they are available commercially and even at the right cost for hobbyists. There are problems though with 3D printing. One of the weaknesses of 3D printing is because of the layering method, they are subject to defects and failure mechanisms based on the poor addition of layers and anisotropy of the build, build up process. So unlike your injection molding, which is let's say a monolithic process, Building these layers can cause defects and failure mechanisms. Uh, so for example, selective laser sintering is a method based on fusing powders that can be addressed uh, by program CNC movement and a laser uh, powerful enough to sinter even metals. Uh, so for example, in metal 3D printing, as you see here, one can create complex objects and designs with different alloys and can be based on selective laser sintering or plasma methods and so on. Uh, metal 3D printing is very important yet is not as widely available as polymer 3D printing simply because they are expensive. But in terms of value, of course, it can go into things like jet engines or very Uh, uh, high performance automotive components. And the raw materials could be powders, could be wires, could be different types of hybrid materials as well. Um, SLA is uh, what I've shown you earlier in terms of lithography. It makes use of resins that actually can be the same composition as used in dental cement, yung pasta. Uh, and then uh, it's also used for coatings. But SLA and DLP are well, some of my favorite methods. Why? Because the chemistry is rich and you can do a lot of nanocomposite formulations. And most of all, it has the best resolution. As you can see here, the, the parts are smooth and you can have very complex geometries. However, uh, one of the most versatile methods of printing is what I call viscous solution printing. So this the way they 3D print cement or chocolate or any paste extrudable material uh, that can be uh, uh, formed into a shape simply by injecting or extruding an extrudable texotropic material through a CNC movement. 
Uh, other uh, types of instruments that are popular are based on binder jet, resins, and UV curing. So there is a move to create farms, production farms, or big build volume 3D printing. And this is how they are meeting the manufacturing gap. So one of these days, uh, a typical injection molding line, uh, parts can be 3D printed using a 3D printing farm or an array of 3D printers, and they can pay for itself in terms of uh, uh, cost and high value adding. Um, here, this is just to remind you that uh, one of the avenues one can 3D print are images that have been obtained by scanning or even conversion of digital information from things like MRI or CT, PET scan, PET, uh, different types of tomography or even biomedical imaging to convert them into a 3D printable file that can be converted to a STL file with an optimized code and then simply 3D printed in most formats. So emphasizing polymers and materials, uh, my real background in terms of materials uh, technology. Uh, when we talk about polymers, we are uh, talking about thermoplastics, rubbers or elastomers and thermosets or epoxies. <clears throat> Thinking about plastics, uh, most of the plastic that we encounter are really commodity polymers or plastics. However, there's a class of polymers or plastics that are very hard to print. They really form the apex of this uh, pyramid as shown here, simply because uh, these polymers are high performance, high temperature, and therefore quite challenging. Yet they are very suitable even for metal replacement. So for example, as you can see here, a polymer like polyether ether ketone has a very high tensile strength. However, it's expensive. On the other hand, what competes on the thermoset uh, arena are what we call polyimides that have also high tensile strength, uh, but also of high value. So the challenge really is to find the right material the, and a right cost with a 3D printable format. But we are not limited to plastics as I've uh, shown earlier. You can 3D print metals, you can 3D print cement, ceramic, other organic materials, food, uh, anything that can be converted from a powder, a plastic filament, a pellet, or an extrudable paste. And this is really where it's going to industry. Uh, in the future, there are many industries like oil and gas, consumer electronics, aerospace, automotive, that will require new materials and 3D printing formats in order to uh, improve complexity or even simplify the number of parts that have to be uh, put or welded together. Uh, some of you may even wonder if recycling has a place in 3D printing. Yes, the answer is yes. Definitely plastics are recyclable. If one can create filaments or composites out of recycled plastic and then 3D print them, yes, they are useful for remanufacturing. And the question is, how do you make filaments? Well, filaments can simply be made by extrusion or um, different types of um, um, mixing, extruding systems that can produce fibers or, or uh, filaments. Uh, rubber, for example, is a challenge. Uh, print 3D printing elastomers and rubber is something that we have been doing in order to meet the challenges of a uh, thermoset or thermoplastic elastomer part. However, uh, a challenge will be 3D printing tires. So here, for example, uh, you can see how much environmental damage uh, uh, that tires uh, that are not disposed properly or uh, need to be recycled can actually be uh, recycled and 3D printed. So the question is the cost and the usage of uh, such type of recyclable 3D printable rubber. Um, nanocomposites uh, means that we can use carbon nanotubes, graphene, nanoclays, something uh, that's close to uh, what I have originally been doing as a researcher in that we have focused a lot on nanomaterials for strengthening composites, providing barrier properties, and even applying them for uh, strengthening of materials. So here is a list 
of some of our papers or publications that are related to nanocomposites and 3D printing. I think I have a list um, uh, at the end of the talk uh, with references as well. Um, so I'll just give one example, uh, cellulose nanomaterials from the Philippines, okay? Uh, we have done some work on harvesting nano cellulose from coconut and abaca, and certainly uh, obtaining them as in the form of nano whiskers or nanofibers, we can then compound them or blend them with polymer materials and resins for 3D printing. So the nanocellulose uh, uh, or whiskers or nano whiskers or nanocrystals are basically obtained from the a broken fibrillar structure of plants. So obtaining them in a high alpha cellulose content from different sources. We actually found that abaca is unique in that it has some very high content or alpha content of this uh, alpha helix crystallinity. So in a stereolithographic apparatus um, method as shown here, the resin which is made up of acrylate monomers, uh, we can blend nanocellulose to come up with a uh, thermoset resin compound. So mixing the nano whiskers together with the uh, resin, we can then use that vat of monomers to 3D print uh, certain structures. So for example, we have used it to 3D print prosthesis or thesis uh, implements, including um, devices that are biocompatible. And we have done a lot of this work on nanocellulose, graphene, carbon nanotubes as composites of different SLA 3D printed materials. Uh, another type of uh, polymer that we have done a bit of work are the polyurethanes. So polyurethanes are uh, based on the reaction of uh, 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 isocyanates and diols or polyols. The presence of hard and soft segments uh, gives it elastomeric properties. Uh, a lot of them are useful for automotive parts, but they have also been used for biomedical implants as well, including the artificial heart and uh, the uh, resins used for dialysis. So TPU polyurethanes are, very, are a very important class of materials. So what we've done uh, in this work back in 2017 was we incorporated a nanomaterial based on graphene oxide uh, we uh, prepared filaments that can be 3D printed. And then by various ratios of the graphene oxide, we were able to demonstrate strengths as well as uh, different um, tensile properties, compressibility, uh, but retaining its, its uh, biocompatible properties as well. So as you can see here, the directionality of the 3D printed uh, material uh, uh, since it's anisotropic, we'll have different strengths based on the direction of printing. So I guess this is the more exciting part or the more uh, relevant part uh, for PAASE uh, members who are, are very much engaged in the Philippines. So you may wonder how I started doing things uh, in the Philippines. Well, it's a long story, of course, if I uh, 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 sum all the things that I've been doing through the years, but let me just focus on why Industry 4.0 in the Philippines makes sense. So at this time, of course, uh, uh, we, we can talk about other things except for the recent pandemic. Industry 4.0 is a catchword for a lot of innovation that will come into many countries as they industrialize and leapfrog current technologies and paradigms. And one of the things I believe that the Philippines deserves to lead is in the area of additive manufacturing. So in fact, almost five years ago, I embarked on training uh, different uh, um, uh, personnel. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of them are Filipinos who, who got their PhD degree with me, but specifically I worked with DOST Pichard to have a visiting scholar program dedicated to 3D printing training. Uh, so far, uh, if I uh, total the number of people that had gone through my group, including DOSD staff, we have, I've trained about 24 people. Uh, and uh, most of them have gone back to the Philippines. Some have started their own labs, some have uh, 
uh, been teaching 3D printing, uh, start their own companies, and then a number of them are operating the additive manufacturing center at DOST. So I will <coughs> I will not go individually on on the names uh, of these group members, but I I think you can just imagine here how many of the Filipinos are represented in my group. Uh, more than that, I have actually brought uh, Case Western Reserve University students at that time, uh, when I was still a faculty at Case, uh, to the Philippines. Uh, these are undergrads who uh, I brought with me visiting several universities where I was um, training and showcasing 3D printing to, to uh, different universities, engaging both undergraduate and high school students on the STEM disciplines, as well as preparing for the 3D printing skills that will be needed by the country. So for example, uh, as you can see here, uh, this was actually a group of students that I brought with me to Ateneo de Davao. We even visited Philippine Science High School. And you can see that uh, good looking young man there. Uh, that's my son, Paul. He's, he's doing a, a PhD at uh, Rice University these days with uh, Jim Tour. But here is what I have really helped the Philippines for the last two years. Uh, through the OST, uh, through Secretary De La Pena uh, and Geb, we helped establish the Additive Manufacturing Center. Uh, this is a rendering of a building that was uh, first designed, but I think it looks very different. Nevertheless, the building is set to completion this year which will house about uh, eight to $10 million worth of 3D printing equipment. And so uh, several uh, things that you can uh, uh, take home here. Uh, one is that uh, this AMSEN is, is probably one of the first in the ASEAN countries to be established as an additive manufacturing center. The only one that I knew that was ahead of us was Singapore. Uh, with DOST disengagement, came uh, in working with MIRDC and ITDI and P-Shared. And I helped lead the formation of this group, but actually uh, uh, the uh, two teams from ITDI and MIRDC are leading the charge uh, in uh, industrial and research aspects of 3D printing. So they call this the MATDEV and the Rapid Admatech projects. Uh, this is uh, funded for now for three years up to 2021. I uh, don't know how long it will be, if it will be extended, but the commission uh, is, has a total budget of 500, 500 million pesos when it was first inaugurated. And the idea is to improve collaboration and develop the ecosystem to work with various industries in the Philippines. Of course, the output will be research projects, collaboration with industry, uh, and different types of output that involves training and growing the ecosystem. So again, this is a, a uh, summary, a picture of how this AMSEN is shaping up. And uh, hopefully on my next visit there, uh, or when they uh, have their own inauguration and conference, uh, you all will have the opportunity to see what has been done. Now, Talking about the Philippine ecosystem and manufacturing, one of the biggest impacts that I see 3D printing going into is in tooling. As you know, any industrialized country has to have the capacity to manufacture its own, whether it's low or high technology. Any manufacturing creates wealth in a country, so simply not importing, not trafficking, not smuggling, these are the things that will build Philippine jobs, will build the Philippine economy. And I'm passionate uh, in, in, in seeing 3D printing make an impact because not only it provides jobs, but provides leadership in technology. So I emphasize tooling, um, manufacturing uh, based on molding, casting, machining, because this traditional forming process is the back of things like uh, engine parts, plastic parts, things that can go into assemblies, uh, different types of tooling, uh, uh, assemblies in the semiconductor industry and so on. 
The problem is the Philippines cannot easily compete with this in terms of imported manufacturing. And, and this is because the Philippines is not set up to have very high standards in this manufacturing uh, ecosystem. By leading 3D printing, we can innovate our own design and therefore be competitive in the supply chain industry. Uh, so for example, the uh, disadvantage and advantage of a traditional forming process, as I mentioned, is that it is capital and tooling uh, intensive. However, by 3D printing, one can create new forms or complexes or geometries or even simplified parts fabrication by equipping the designers the ability to use CAD design, use the right materials, 3D print the prototype and eventually 3D print the tools and the molds. Uh, so in rapid uh, tooling, and by the way, we've published a paper uh, at MRS Communications with Kokoy on this in that even uh, a simple uh, plastic injection molding can be rapidly upgraded uh, via 3D printing uh, by learning how to make these molds and dyes uh, in a digital process. Now, uh, the savings can be as much as 70% in time and cost. Uh, one of the things that we are, are looking for is in automotive tooling, mold and design. So for example, things like thermoforming or casting, or even uh, these uh, tools that are made of metal. So imagine instead of machining these parts, uh, importing them from Taiwan or Singapore, one can fabricate them in the Philippines and use a digital format to change the design or come up with new designs. That is why part of the training that I gave to the DOST staff was to tour them around uh, the manufacturing demonstration facility at Oak Ridge, where they were able to sample how 3D printing uh, helps the tooling industry in terms of metal and polymer tooling capabilities. So being able to bring this to the Philippines, both the technology, the know-how and the materials aspect will allow us to leapfrog many Asian countries in the area of manufacturing. As you can see here, some of the staff are looking at uh, uh, robotics that are able to do multi-axis uh, fabrication as well as different molds that were fabricated by 3D printing of metals. Uh, here at the background, you can see different machines. In fact, uh, an amazing machine here called the Big Area Additive Manufacturing Machine can 3D print wing parts, very big boat parts or even the keel of a boat or different types of big areas based on plastic composites. And it's possible to do this today. So that means that you can fabricate these molds, dyes and tools very rapidly, big area. Here you can see uh, me on a 3D printed Jeep. So things that will go into my, your mind, we need to 3D print a Jeep. Well, uh, what's interesting here is this 3D print Jeep design is about 75 years old, meaning by 3D printing, they were able to resurrect a very old design of the original Jeep. The other thing you, you may ask is what parts here were 3D printed? I would say about 60% of what you see here on this uh, US Army Jeep was 3D printed. So that means excluding the tires, in excluding some parts of the engine, and excluding the optics, most of the uh, parts here on this Willis Jeep were 3D printed. So you can see additive manufacturing can impact the Philippines in many sectors from automotive, electronics, packaging, parts replacement, healthcare, marine industry, food industry, defense procurement, production, recycling technologies, okay? even in distributed healthcare and devices. I used to tell the, the uh, DOSD staff, my vision is to see a 3D printer in every barangay. So what that means is that in every barangay, you can 3D print your own prosthesis devices or 3D print parts that normally you'd have to wait and, and buy expensively by making 3D printing accessible to the community. I'm sure they'll find many uses for repair replacement and healthcare. Uh, even in electronics, being able to 3D print different 
active based metals and make uh, simplified PCB board designs and semiconductor uh, parts uh, is one of the goals of 3D printing in combination with the right materials. And then finally, robotics, 3D printing of soft robotics means that one can make uh, robotics uh, in terms of soft materials like elastomers or pneumatic types of movement instead of uh, met metal gears and arms. Uh, 3D printing actually opens the way for um, ro ro uh, robotics or ro um, automotive uh, um, autonomic technologies based on soft matter or polymers. Okay, so again, high value adding, rapid prototyping and production for the Philippine industries. This is our aim. This is hopefully what we can see in the Philippines in years to come uh, with cooperation from many sectors, from universities, uh, NGOs, DOST, and of course, uh, uh, infusion of funding from uh, different sources. One can make this ecosystem uh, uh, in the Philippines and make the Philippines one of the leaders in uh, the region. So in summary, uh, 3D printing of new materials. I've, I've shown you some of the important aspects, methods and materials, the uh, possibilities for the Philippine industries going from commodity driven to high value adding, the need towards high performance materials, be it metals, elastomers, thermosets, thermoplastics, uh, now is a good time to see how investments on new machines, training, skills uh, can be directed towards healthcare, defense industries, assembly industries, and so on. And hopefully uh, this vision is something that we can link up with investment, government initiatives, as well as private investors in additive manufacturing. So with that, I'd like to thank you and I'll be happy to answer any questions from Paase. Thank you very much, Godet. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. And um, it's, uh, I think, something very exciting for the Philippines if we can really build our capabilities towards additive manufacturing. And we're quite lucky that you're here to help out um, as well with the training of our um, researchers and scientists. So just as a reminder for our participants, we have our chat. So you can type in any uh, comments and questions you may have. And we also have some viewers in our YouTube channel. Um, I'll be taking in some comments and questions from there also. So maybe I'll just begin. Um, I'm uh, more interested uh, when you uh, mentioned about uh, um, being able to recycle some of this 3D printed uh, materials. Um, so my question would be, is there um, a reduction in terms of performance or in the properties of uh, the materials once they've been uh, recycled? Yes, Kay, that's a good question. Uh, and, and it's well known uh, recycled materials, even through conventional methods, uh, suffer a decrease in performance over time. Maybe. Uh, the ability to recycle two, three, or even 10 times is about mm -hmm. the limit. And uh, with uh, polymers, the problem is uh, increasing impurity as well as the breakdown of the yeah. original component. And so sometimes one has to master batch it with the addition of virgin polymers or other strengthening additives in order to use it again and again. But certainly, uh, recyclable materials can be 3D printed and vice versa. 3D printed materials can be recycled. Uh, there is actually a new class of polymers called vitrimers, which can be recycled between what we call a thermoset and thermoplastic in, in several iterations. Okay, thank you. So I'll take in one question from the YouTube channel. This one's from Al Serafica. Is there a 3D printed product used commercially in the Philippines? What is the sales volume? And if not, which one do you think will make it and when? Well, I like that question. Uh, actually, I, what I miss giving in this talk, and I'm ab about to finish a paper on PPE, PPEs and ventilator parts uh, by 3D printing. Okay. Um, so uh, if, when the paper is published, I'll be happy to spread it to Paase. Uh, PPEs, uh, of course, have been relevant the last few months because of uh, the shortage of masks um, 
parts for um, uh, uh, ventilators, intubation, uh, different types of uh, um, devices for respirators. So uh, if one can quantify how that how much that contributed in, in terms of value, I think it's going to be large uh, in terms of monetary value. Now, if, it, if we're talking about commercial product that's available in the Philippines, I know several entrepreneurs are looking at uh, uh, soles for rubber shoes, 3D printed soles for sports gear as a uh, real product. But what I've been also hearing is that 3D printing is making its way towards the dental industry in terms of uh, 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 you know, art, uh, temporary crown or different types of model for um, dental implants and so on. Okay, thanks. All right, we have our next question from Christina Binag, who's with us now in Zoom. So, on studies of 3D printed face masks using polyurethane, please comment on the breathability and other properties of this material. Yeah, so Tina, the uh, plastic itself that makes the frame of the mass or other things uh, besides the breathing material or the filter can actually be made from many types of plastics from, from a PLA to PP to polyurethane to uh, ABS. Uh, although we've found that PLA probably is the, the right uh, cost uh, strength combination. So in terms of the... Um, the mass itself, the filter itself, of course, uh, these are melt blown spun fibers of polypropylene or even polyethylene. And they're the material that makes your 3M mass or your N95 mass. However, what's interesting is some of the, these materials that have gone to PPE, people have been, been investigating the addition of silver and copper powders or composites in order to provide more antimicrobial, and of course, uh, their aim is to see antiviral properties uh, in, as an improvement on the material properties of these PPEs. Okay, thank you for that. Um, our next question comes from Raymond Tan in YouTube. Um, he says, uh, he's asking if it's feasible to 3D print objects with heterogeneous compositions. Um, is it possible that the compositions would be in gradients? Uh, yes, Raymond, uh, you have several ways of doing that. You can blend compound uh, hybrid materials, you know, basically composites of plastics and inorganic materials, or you can direct a multi-material 3D printer to deposit separate materials in layers or, or, uh, or aspects of the design. So for example, you can, reserve one area to 3D print metals, uh, then perhaps 3D print on top of it another metal, or you can 3D print one type of polymer in one region or one direction over the other. So either blending or directing the CNC movement and the type of filaments or materials that are printed in a uh, series uh, direction will allow you to have a heterogeneity in both, actually in both materials and design uh, um, to, to come up with a, a better part. Okay, I have a follow-up question on that. Um, it's quite related. Um, with regards to that, um, with the machines that are available, uh, how flexible are they in terms of the kind of material that they can actually print? Um, you mentioned that it's possible to do like hybrids. And, yeah. Right. Uh, so it depends on the starting material you have. If you're working with powders, uh, very fine powders, the typical technique is based on SLS or selective laser sintering. If you're starting with the filament, uh, you, you will use FDM. If you're starting with a resin based on acrylate monomers or blend, you would use SLA or DLP. Um, and then if you're starting with the paste or extrudable um, viscous material, you will use direct ink writing or viscous solution printing. So, so a short answer there is it depend, depending on the material, there's a machine out there that can 3D print it. 
Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Richard Abendan, who's with us here in Zoom. So what has been uh, Philippine industry feedback on the availability of capabilities in 3D printing for tooling? What are the barriers to having industries pursue this opportunity and which Philippine industry sector shows the most promise or enthusiasm? Oh, I like this question with many, many faces in it. There <laughs> several questions embedded into one. Uh, so Richard, the, the, uh, the industry we're targeting or we could target is the plastics industry. The plastics industry provide many supplies or uh, um, uh, assembly uh, manufacturing for automotive, for consumer electronics, for um, uh, other industries uh, that require a lot of molding, injection molding, thermoforming, etc. So trying to target these industries in terms of convincing them to invest on or work with 3D printing centers capable of producing the molds, the dyes, based on CAD design, which can replace direct, directly the tools and molds that they usually obtain from metals by machining. So uh, here in the US, we've studied some of this value chain. Uh, there can be anywhere from 30 to 70% savings in cost as well as shortening of the production time to one third when one employs uh, digital manufacturing and 3D printing in the process. So yes, uh, it will take some time to uh, spread that knowledge, but hopefully with, uh, let's say the AMSEN, that can be a demonstration lab that many uh, manufacturers, um, not only really the, the uh, plastics industry, but any, local manufacturer can see the value of uh, digital design and development of tools, molds, and dyes for their own specific industry. One, one of the things that actually I, I can add at this point is the replacement industry or the replacement of parts. You know, in the Philippines, there are many, many old machines that are barely working or uh, is not working because it's missing a piece. And I'm not even talking about just local industry, but even our military from Air Force to Army, they are looking for replacement parts. And 3D printing has a very high potential to supply these needs because of digital design and the ability to 3D print metals, plastics, and composites. Okay, thank you for that. We have our next question from Jean Pimentel, who's actually from Colombia. So thank you for that presentation. What is the factor that has the largest contribution on the cost for 3D printing? And how can this technology become more accessible? Yeah, so uh, I, the biggest um, cost is, of course, development of the machines itself. Uh, some of this, this technology really is quite old, but Probably in the 80s, uh, some of the more uh, recent developments were formed. And uh, that has been paid for, uh, meaning the, the cost of uh, machines are rapidly declining. The R&D is there. So, so the biggest investment, of course, it, is, is that if one goes into 3D printing, is, uh, is the you know, acquisition of the machines itself. Now, the most important investment is really the people the staff, the know-how. Uh, so being able to get trained engineers, scientists to be able to see the gamut of 3D printing and its role in, in uh, improving design or combining properties of materials with design, that is something that hopefully we will address and train Filipinos for future jobs. Okay, thank and you other for, countries too, not just Filipinos. But. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I have a, I have a question. So you've been working a lot with um, the Filipino, uh, Philippine universities. So maybe one of my questions would be, in terms of curriculum, um, how can we better equip our uh, future engineers um, so that they will be, uh, you know, more capable uh, towards uh, this particular technology? Yeah, good question, Kay. So. Uh, yeah, it is a really loaded question for me because I'm so passionate with helping Philippine education, especially engineering. As, as some of you may know, I contributed a lot to requiring technical entrepreneurship uh, as part of the engineering curriculum. 
But what I would say is that um, if you are, have a fabrication lab, a maker space in a university, that's a good start. Just having 3D printers accessible to uh, engineers, scientists, architects, or students to play around with the use, that's a start. But probably to formalize thing one, formalize it one can start courses in materials and 3D printing. So for example, at UT, uh, where I just joined this year, I'm, I'm going to start a class in the fall on polymers and 3D printing, which is a way to teach polymer science and engineering combined with 3D printing so that they can see the aspect of materials research and its application to additive manufacturing. So yeah, uh, establish a lab, a makerspace lab, a design uh, lab, a hub, techno hub or innovation lab with 3D printers and then uh, the professors or some of the professors can team teach uh, a 3D printing curriculum. Uh, they can combine it with materials research or simply uh, training on CAD design and different types of CNC machine movement. Um, so you, you mentioned about uh, CNC. So I know that some of our schools have those old machines, the, the CNC. So with the um, advent of this uh, 3D material, so do this go, like, do they complement each other or does, does knowledge in one help um, progress on, on the other? Or do you think that some of the technology are quite old already and that perhaps we can transition towards the more modern technology now? Okay, they, they really do. They really complement each other. I mean, CNC movement, uh, computer, uh, I think numerically controlled movement, that's CNC, is really what they use for machining or different types of machining milling or what we call subtractive manufacturing. So when you combine subtractive manufacturing with additive manufacturing, you have the best of both worlds. Uh, actually, the digital design, the CAD design can go both the subtractive and additive manufacturing route. The difference is that the uh, uh, CNC is based on, uh, or machining is based on cutting and lots of waste materials generated. However, the parts you obtained are monolithically strong. On the other hand, with additive manufacturing, you can have more access to complexity in design, but again, it still uses the digital format. So yes, combining both um, uh, CNC machining and additive manufacturing is the way to go. Okay, we have another question from um, Nikolai Santos. So he's a pr prosthetist and orthotist and works with artificial limbs and braces. Are there any progress on custom made 3D printed silicone products, specifically fingers and ears? These days we send them overseas for custom made fingers and ears. Mm -hmm. Good question. So actually, uh, I think two days, uh, uh, no, two weeks ago, I gave a talk on 3D printing silicones and elastomers. Uh, it's developing, it's actually the technology is there. Uh, the material is there as well. Uh, 3D printing uh, is, is possible uh, instead of molding or using them based on a formative manufacturing process. So in this case, uh, if we're looking at a size that can go to a prosthesis or orthesis device for the human body, it's possible. It may not look as nice as let's say a molded part, but one can do some finishing to convert it into a very aesthetic looking part. But uh, I would say the technology and material is there to do 3D printing for the uh, medical industry. Okay. Thank you. Um, is the capability available in the country? Is it available in the Philippines? Sorry. Um, I don't think so, but I know of several companies that are trying to make it available uh, for the industry. So, for example, before I left Case, I was working with Cleveland Clinic, okay. and they have a lot of um, synthetic cad cadavers uh, based on rubber or elastomers, oh. and we were looking at combining 3D printing for medical training uh, where we can use uh, uh, tomography, scanning, uh, et cetera, uh, principles in order to combine it with the clinical training with artificial or um, art, uh, you know, cadavers based with elastomeric silicone. Because the, the, 
the feel or the texture of a silicon material is closer to, to the human body or skin. The other is in terms of um, uh, what they call uh, um, virtual reality. So virtual, uh, uh, virtual reality training of medical students using, using 3D printed uh, implements, things like that. So there are many, many possibilities there. If one can combine this with AI or, or imaging, and at the same time, uh, if your target is in training medical people, there are many possibilities. Thank you. The next question comes from uh, Dr. Donna Balela. Um, is it possible to use 1D nanomaterials as fillers in filaments? They are trying to make conductive filaments by making silver nanowires and polymers mm. via extrusion, but they were unsuccessful. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, if you are looking at carbon nanotubes, nanowires, nano whiskers, yes. Uh, I think the question would be wh where to start. Uh, one can compound them with uh, polymers, uh, thermoplastics, or even use them as, as a uh, thermoset resin composition. So you will have to decide, first of all, what effect do you want? Do you want them to form a network structure or have directionality in terms of conductivity? If you want them to line up in one direction, then an extrusion process is preferable. On the other hand, if you want a certain percolation threshold based on the network structure uh, that can give you that conductivity, then you will have to make studies in terms of the percentage composition and the corresponding property. And uh, an ideal uh, 3D printing method on that would be SLA or stereo stereolithographic apparatus. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the next question comes again from Richard. At Stride, we will be supporting a network of fab labs in academia. What do you think are new services and capabilities that these facilities should look into? So um, I, uh, I'm not familiar with how accessible our, uh, our uh, design, CAD designs, uh, different types of uh, slicing software uh, is in the Philippines, but that would be a good contribution because I heard that sometimes those, the, the ability or to democratize those type of software uh, can be a limiting factor. Uh, but in terms of machines, uh, FDM machines are easily accessible, although one will uh, invest in more reliable machines that do not break down easily. But I would say a fab lab, which can be equipped with both the software and at least three or four different types of printers uh, can do wonders. They can uh, explore uh, 3D printing of indigenous materials or different types of uh, materials that can be obtained from the supply chain. And the training with different machines allow them to appreciate both the materials and designs aspect of 3D printing. Okay, thank you. So I guess we've exhausted all of the questions. Um, do you have any um, final advice, words, Gobet, uh, for our audience? Um, so I didn't catch that, uh, Kay, but uh, I think you were asking me to give my parting shots. Yes, <laughs> correct. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Kay. This is really an opportunity and a privilege, of course, to talk to our PASE colleagues and uh, to be in YouTube as well. Uh, and uh, my wish, of course, is for everyone to stay healthy, strong, and inspired. Uh, don't uh, be anxious for a lot of things, but move forward. You know, the, the day uh, is, is closer than it seems, or the end is in sight. But uh, really, uh, what I would like to, to say, of course, with regards to additive manufacturing, 3D printing, is don't be afraid to try it. It's easy to get into and will be useful for the next generation. So I hope I'll have a chance to see you all in person one of these days. Again, stay healthy and be strong. Okay, thank you very much, Gobet. But before we end this session, again, I want to plug some of our activities. Um, okay, so let me just share my screen. Okay, so... Okay, so I want to invite everyone for next week's webinar. So it will be by Dr. Jacqueline Romero. Um, the title of her talk is Ignorance in a Quantum World. So 
Jackie is part of the University of Queensland and her uh, main expertise is on um, quantum world um, and uh, physics. So I'd like to invite everyone to our 40th Paase anniversary and 2020 annual Paase meeting and symposium. So we will be holding the seminars from July 20 to August 14. That's every day, Monday to Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. So if you want details about the program, um, you can scan the QR code that you see on this slide and it will take you to our website where you can have more information about our activities and an updated schedule of the program. So we'll we still have our call for papers open. Uh, the deadline is initially July 5. So abstract guidelines can be found in this uh, link. And you can email it to paasemanila2020 at gmail.com. So we welcome contributions both from Paase and non-Paase members. Okay, so finally, you can uh, find us on Facebook. We have our page on uh, Facebook. We also have our website at paase.org and our YouTube channel, which is Paase Webinars at bit.ly slash paase webinars, where the recorded uh, webinars will be uploaded. Okay, so that's the end of this particular session. So thank you, everyone, and have a good day ahead. Bye.